So my own story is, is probably not too unlike everyone here. I've been a producer of life insurance, disability, and also I got into the investment business and annuity business for the last 20 years in a city called Philadelphia in the United States. And like most people my age, I'm 44 now, uh, I was always intrigued by technology and I knew that I had to invest in technology in my own practice. And I was a little bit of that avant-garde. I tried everything uh, even before it was popular. Uh, and uh, if you get an opportunity to talk to me, I'm happy to share what that journey has looked like. Um, but what I realized very early on is that it was not just about the technology, right? It's about that human experience that we're trying to create with people so that we feel connection and we actually develop relationships long term. But what I want to share with you is a couple things, and I hope that you're taking notes, because I put a lot of information that I've learned over the last, we'll say, 10 years in the technology space, uh, as I have my practice as well, um, that's going to be instrumental in the decisions that you make and what you're going to invest in over the next couple of years. Because clearly there's so much that we can do, but we can't do all of it. So I want to share that with you. I also want to scare you a little bit because I need to share with you what is happening in our industry and where we have critical areas that we need to protect against. We call them disruptors. So hopefully you're sitting up with lots of attention and you're ready to learn um, for the next 28 minutes. Okay. Right now, there's an extraordinary amount of money going into what we call disruptive fintech. In fact, last quarter alone, there was $5 billion US that went into venture firms that were actually going to try to figure out a way to eliminate the distribution field force for financial services products. That was last quarter. And what's happening is if you follow the money, you see that basically, this is going to cause an extraordinary change in our industry. How do we connect with people when the uh, internet uh, companies and robo-advisors are going direct to our customers? And if you're trying to pick out the technology that's available to you as a manager or a leader of your organization, you realize that the choices are now so many, you don't know where to start. And this was actually a, an image that was created in the United States. It's already out of date and probably twice as large as this image in terms of the type of tools that you can add to your system. Now, all of our carriers and affiliations are trying to ask the question, should we build the next technology solution or should we just buy what's new and out there? And this is not an easy solution because most of us in the field would like them to solve the problem yesterday, right? Can you relate to that? Don't we know technology that's out there that we could implement in our practice today and would make it better? But unfortunately, we have this long process. And I wanted to give a, a little bit of a testament to what, what most headquarters are dealing with. There's an extraordinary risk around adding new technology just because it's new and it's exciting. Many of these small companies will not make it. That leaves us exposed. They have to have data continuity plans and privacy. And if you're uh, following what's happening in Europe, the GDPR requires an extraordinary amount of due diligence that has to be taken on the data that we collect from our customers. And so it's actually quite difficult to make these decisions. The regardless of what ultimately we choose to do as, as managers and as leaders, we have to focus on this singular topic. We call it UX, or user experience. And why is this important? It's because everybody in this room judges what their experience is by based on whether they have a positive or negative user experience. Pretty much for anything. For every restaurant you might go to while you're here, if you had a fantastic bowl of pho, awesome, I loved it, I had a great user experience, I'm gonna tell everybody to go to that restaurant, okay? And by the way, I did have a fantastic bowl of pho the other day, I will tell you where it was. <laughs> um, but if it's not good, we're gonna tell everybody to, and I was taught this by my coach, uh, Steve Bauer, and he told me that nothing is neutral to your preeminence. Please think about that. Nothing is neutral to preeminence. It either lifts or it detracts from your reputation. So user experience is critically important, and we know this because surveys have told us that 90% of people um, make their decisions based upon good user experience, and of course, 95% of us will actually uh, choose to um, perhaps bad mouth or put a bad review in social context um, when they have a bad experience. What's interesting for all of us is that these are the leaders for user experience today. Right? These are the companies we all do business with. We have accounts with these companies. They give us a, an idea of what we should be expecting. And of course, they're telling, uh, they're basically deciding for us what our customers are gonna look for when they do business with us, okay? And so what concerns me is a plausible future 
for the distribution of life insurance and different critical care products basically moves towards uh, the online buying exclusively, right? People who are like me purchased this life insurance, uh, so why don't you just buy it right now? In the United States, Alexa has taken on a, a, a very large role where basically you just, I don't know if anybody else is using this, but you wake up in the morning and you say, tell me what the weather is going to be, and Alexa will tell you. But what if you just ask Alexa, oh, you know what, actually, I just had a child. Uh, Alexa, can you get me some life insurance? And Alexa delivers your life insurance through your account. Or, if you're in the investment world or starting to get into this world, why can't Google or Alibaba or Tencent, why can't they actually just provide portfolios for free right through their services now? And they don't need us, right? And if you're looking for reviews of your, um, let's say, of your individual advice delivery, perhaps they'll can do a better job, just like they do in restaurants, and telling us uh, who's a five-star. Mm -hmm. I would be really concerned if I had one negative rating on there because okay. it will affect actually and how people up. buy from you. Isn't that interesting? So and of right course, robo-advisors are not sitting still. Right? There's development of great user experiences that are going direct to consumers where ultimately they're going to disintermediate nice and sure. So, despite this, I think there's something very interesting. And it happens upon this quote from Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon.com. And at this point, the wealthiest person in the world. Now, what he said was really critical here, and I know it's a long sentence, but here is the takeaway. Many people ask him, what is the future going to look like? And he says that this is not the right question. He asks, what is not going to change? Because ultimately, this is what is investable. For Amazon, it's low prices, fast delivery, and lots of choices, correct? That makes sense. And if he continues to invest in these things that are core to his business, he knows that there are good investments. So the question is, what are, what are our investable standards? And we think, or my team thinks, that ultimately our customer's expectation are that their advisor or their professional knows me, knows my situation, and knows my options. Regardless of how the technology changes, that is the expectation of all consultants and advocates for people which means we need to do needs-based analysis more than ever. We need, to pro we need to focus ultimately on why people do something, do what they do. And here's what's interesting about the financial services business that we are all in. It is no longer a services business. It is a decisions business. Now please think about that. If the financial decisions business, we have to help people make better decisions, right? That's really our mantra and it's really our goal. But what's interesting about this is that there's really two, um, two parts of the financial decision, right? We all know that sometimes decisions are complex, and we need to help people make those decisions despite their complexity, and that's why we have to uh, be uh, credible. And also we know that there's a cost of being wrong. Now, if you imagine this as a chart that we would have viewed in high school, perhaps, uh, you know on to the right there's a high cost of being wrong, and then to the top there is high complexity, right? And of course, there's a relationship here. And what we think is gonna happen is that where things are simple or there's a low cost of being wrong, direct technology will actually assume a great part of our marketplace, okay? That's what we think is gonna happen over the next five years. However, where we are still extremely relevant is when we need to talk about topics where we can't afford to redo this. You can't retire twice. You can't protect your business twice. You can't you know, undo the tax planning we did not do. And so we're really going to have to focus, in our opinion, on, really, on the areas where humanity and, and making decisions are really, uh, really critical. And here, ultimately, what really matters in that financial advice. So we need to adopt the technology that supports saving uh, margin, right? Lower costs in the areas where technology can do really good things. But we need to really focus on the empathy and the relationship and the connection that people are really seeking, right? That's what we're really seeking in this relationship so that we can make complex and uh, important decisions together. The interesting thing about this in our research is that 86% of buyers will actually pay more. They want to pay more if they're going to get value, but they're not getting this value. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for us to actually disintermediate technology by delivering more humanity. And this is really interesting to me. So um, I ask you uh, to challenge yourself in this and ask yourself today or over the course of this week, what is your ideal customer experience? I think if you don't think about the intentionality of this, 
Just like Chris mentioned, you don't think about your purpose in life in everyday living. We need to think about what is the intentionality of that user experience for our customers. It may be different for each of us, but we have to choose and we have to be intentional about it. And what are the critical investments that we need to make this year? Because we cannot wait. This is happening all around us. While we're sitting here, there are people programming to try to take our business. The question you must also ask is, are you going to build this or are you going to buy it? And what resources do you really need to compete when you go back to your homes and you talk to your, your peers and your leadership and management and you say, this is what I critically need and this is why. Now, I've also taken some time uh, in the remaining time that we have together to share with you a survey that I have been putting together for the past two years of our customers. The Asset Map project has taken a life of its own and we're very honored in here to be, uh, to be sponsoring in part of Gamma because we really feel a kindred uh, uh, experience with the Gamma community. And so in giving back to you, I want to share that last, the last two years we've, we've gotten back feedback from those thousands of advisors using our platforms and customers to ask them what were the critical experience journey uh, that you needed to focus on. And I hope that you have your notes because my hope is that you'll take two or three of these ideas and try to figure out how to implement them. Before I tell you this, I need to tell you that everybody, every company today is a tech company. And this was actually said back in 2013. But the challenge is that most of us are still responding like a financial services company, right? right? And that, what does that mean? It means we tend to be slow, and we tend to think about things too often until it's no longer relevant, and then it's a legacy decision, right? Unfortunately, that's our history, all right? But so today, we need to start thinking like a technology company. And a technology company does a couple of things I want to share with you. Number one, technology companies do sprints. Now, sprints are literally a total immersion, all-hands commitment to solve a problem. Imagine locking yourself in a room with people who are competent and capable of executing something, and you do not leave this room until you solve the problem or have a working prototype at the end of this period of time. Can you imagine how much you would get done if literally everybody who was supposed to be part of the decision got together and made a decision? This is what technology companies do. We haven't figured that out in financial services yet. They also test everything. They come up with two different ways of experiences. Here's a message to you and a message to you, and then they test it, and they monitor it, and they get feedback, okay? So I'm really challenging you to start thinking this way in whatever user experience you come up with that you want to innovate, you test it continuously. You need to decide that you own the user experience. It is not haphazard, it is intentional. Right? Think about it, if you owned a restaurant, you wouldn't just say, well, we serve some of this noodle soup, and that's good enough. You would think, okay, is there silverware there? Are there chopsticks? Is there water? Are these other services there? Because I want a specific experience. We need to do the same in financial services. And of course, we have to support the entire customer journey. Not just sell a great product at a great price, and then see you later, okay? We have to actually figure out what is that entire customer journey with my experience, my organization, and do I own that user experience along the entire path? Okay? So here is this, there's the survey that I wanted to share with you. Really, really good insights, and I hope that you're paying attention. So this, um, this survey was done with uh, wealth managers, insurance agents, uh, annuity producers, actually consumers, and we asked three basic questions. Number one, who is providing an ideal experience in the financial service experience, by analogy. In other words, it's very similar to something else. I'm gonna show you this, it's really cool. Um, what are the stages of the journey? Do I even know what your journey looks like, Mr. or Mrs. Client and advisor? And then what are your expectations of that experience, right? What are you, what are you actually judging me on? And here's what we came up with. This is fun. So, the customers asked us the following. They said, schedule meetings like a dentist. That's a dentist or a doctor, okay? Why is that relevant? Because in the United States, dentists schedule the next meeting at the end of the previous meeting, okay? And if they can't schedule your appointment for your dentist then, they send you automated emails or they call you to try to make sure that they're scheduling you and you're always scheduled, right? I want my financial experience like Netflix on any device when I want it. Text me about my account balances like Apple and ask me about my financial health like a caring doctor might. 
right? Ask me what else is going on in my life. I can't tell you everything based upon account statements. Explain my financial condition like a primary school teacher. Okay, that's nice. Uh, see what other people bought, uh, other people like me purchased on Amazon. Buy financial products right now, like eBay. Although eBay doesn't exist over here much anymore. Um, let me move my money between all my accounts. That's very common actually in Asia. And let me skip the signing pur uh, purchases just like Starbucks, right? I can go purchase a coffee and not have to sign, but if I purchase a life insurance policy in many countries still, I have to sign 50 documents that clearly are not getting read. And so the point is we want to we figure out that better. Okay, last couple here. Track my underwriting like FedEx tracks my packages. Where is this thing? Does anybody know? Send me financial progress like Instagram, right? I need visualizations. Tell me, are we doing good? Um, and create an archive like, on our, of, like Facebook of our relationship and all the decisions we've made together. And then of course it says rank my financial professionals like restaurants on Yelp. Are you a five star, a five and a half star, a four star? Right? This is going to become the way that we actually start to communicate, right? So here's what, here's a, this is really what I want to write down. Um, the journey actually, and I'm going to break this down quicker for you, it came down into these five categories. So if you're taking a photograph, that's the time to take the photograph. Okay, just like that. I'm done. I know I'm tall, but I'm done. Um, what's important about this, and I'm going to walk you through this very quickly, is that actually the experience came back from all of these responses. We're talking over 500 responses that were actually written out. In other words, we didn't want people to, to answer uh, a bullet or choose between these two and we're telling you what the journey is. They were free-form answers, which means we had to call them down to get to this, and it came down to basically five stages that basically everybody said. You're introduced to an advisor, you interact with them initially, they provide you some guidance, uh, they implement some solution, and lastly, they form a relationship. And of these categories, the top two here were, um, were indicated by both the uh, clients and the advisors. Now, don't read this. Sorry, and this is more for impact. What matters about this, these were the top five or six categories for every single element that uh, both the customer and the advisor shared, and I believe these slides are available to you. But if we focus on the journey overlap, where were these things actually overlapping? We saw something really interesting. What happens actually is that both the advisor and the customer have the same pain points in these five areas. Hmm. If we can invest in 50 different technologies today, but I can break it down to maybe 10 areas that we really want to focus on because we get extra leverage, because I'm serving both our professionals and our customers, well, that's interesting to know. So here's what it came down to. I'm going to give you an idea in each one of these stages that you really need to focus on based upon this survey. Number one, when we're introducing our advisors, we need to move back to the idea that our technology displays our humanity. First impressions are basically, and this is actually my business partner, Andy Rubin, this is our website. You go to our website, that is what you see. You see a human. You don't see a calculator. You don't see the stock market. You see a person because this is about connecting with the person, this is just a window to do it. And so the question is, how are we connecting with our prospects on our humanity using the technology? Number two, scheduling like a dentist, right? How many times do our advisors and agents spend time reaching out so that they can schedule appointments, making sure that they're scheduled and they're actually committed to showing up on time and they actually don't get left at the meeting without someone to sell? Now, this happens way too often, and there's technology that can solve this today. There's a, uh, we have, this is an example of one where literally you can go online and you can choose what time you want to meet with your advisor. It will send you automated notes, I'm sorry, automated uh, reminders, and it will put in your calendar, and this should be automated. There's no reason today why we should actually be scheduling if you're using some form of technology. How do we interact with our customer? Think about this, please. Today we have great technology, but this is still a toes-to-toes, nose-to-nose business, right? We have relationships that we've created with people over the years, but they are now using FaceTime and Skype 
and uh, WeChat to communicate with their entire families, yet we're still expecting them to come into the office. No, that doesn't make any sense. So we need to be able to deliver a user experience that has paper, the way we traditionally need, but also projection like this, or remote screen sharing. And your technology solutions have to drive this capability because we need the choicefulness to use those different technologies when we're meeting with people. Interaction number two, how do we collect data from our customers? If you are in a heavily regulated environment, there is a mandate for us to, to get this information, otherwise we cannot suitably sell or place an investment or insurance product, correct? But we all know that I said in the beginning, the customer's expectation is that we actually know the client. So KYC in the States, know your client, those protocols are critical, but I, got, I don't know how to get this information any faster. Well, there is new technology that enables us to go out to the customer, collect some data on their smartphone, and then automatically pre-populate a lot of our fact-finding. I will tell you that people who are engaged with you have a very high likelihood of wanting to give you this information anyway. As long as it's not overwhelming, and they don't have to show up to your meeting with a big box of papers and statements that they don't understand. Okay? If we can help them get to uh, a place where they've delivered some information faster, that will serve everybody. Guidance. Oh yeah, I said this. Compliance departments want this as well. Okay? And that would be good for everybody. Okay. Guidance, number three. We have a lot of data on our, on our clients, but unfortunately our systems do not speak. And so in the guidance area, the number one respondent uh, for advisors and customers was to deliver a guidance experience that had integrations with all of the existing data you already have. Can anybody relate to that? You have data in different files, and the, and the system is now requiring that data, you have to find it. Why don't they just talk? And so the bigger challenge for all of us is to figure out what are the critical systems, because there are too many potential systems to integrate. It would take us years to do this. By the time we figure it out, these things and these, these topics will be out of date as a product, if you will. And so what I focus on is the three critical areas of the great aggregation here, which is portfolio, financial planning, and CRM, or customer relationship management tools. These are critical for you guys to try to figure out a way to integrate over time, because it's not gonna happen tomorrow. When we give guidance, when we make recommendations, the key is we have to find a way to make those recommendations simple. I think we all know this. Many of us have actually started our practices by drawing on a piece of yellow paper and basically telling somebody, these are the recommendations that I'm making to. Can you relate to that? Is that what you do now? By the way, our top advisors, we know they do this today still. They still draw on a board or they put, take out a piece of paper or a napkin and they make, they make their sale this way. We need to use technology to now do this so we can catalog this. And one of the, one of the we really have not seen a lot of entrance in the technology into the recommendation space for creating executive summaries. Uh, let's talk about implementation. A lot of carriers are focusing right now on uh, reduced underwriting experiences, uh, or uh, in fact, I was, uh, I was talking actually, where are you, there you go. So I was talking uh, about, um, what's uh, going on in India, actually, to a person I sat next to it at breakfast yesterday. <laughs> and I started talking to him, and he says that, that uh, they can do apps uh, almost entirely off of their ID card with a fingerprint, and they can start, uh, they can populate all the data. I thought that was really interesting. The point about it is that because the user experience today is mandated that we deliver them on demand and execution today, we need to figure out a way to get it to, to buy an app. So how can we, think about this for yourself, how can we get to a place where ultimately we can have our clients just make a buying decision and buy it and execute it in 24, 48 hours, something really soon uh, and meaningful so that we give them that, that positive impact? Can we give them transparency, and, doc transparency excuse me, and documentation where they know where everything lasts, where it's just like this FedEx approach. It was really actually heavy in the survey to basically said, I want to understand where we are in the process. You took my money, you took my application, uh, I've got my portfolio with you, where are we in this process and how does it relate to my major goals? And for most of us that are trying to build platforms that the customer can interact with us on the internet or in the web, we need to find a place that replaces our office. 
Now, I know that many of you are actually meeting with your clients in their space, but as we move more towards a virtual experience, one of the interesting things that we've seen in Dynamics is that people need a place to be, right? Whether we meet at the cafe, or we meet at grandma's house, or we meet at our friend's backyard, or whatever it is, or we meet at the office, there is a community that is created when we have a place to visit. And when we don't have that place because it's been replaced by these vaults, maybe what we really need is we need to have a place that lives on the, on the, on the uh, homepage of these that actually supports our relationship. And so what I call relationship portals today is probably going to be the area that we all need to focus on in our business. And of course, if you're going to have an ongoing relationship, that means we need to deliver something, right? I mean, think about it. We can't just do this. We sold the product, and now we walked away. And I'm going to be talking about that at my breakout at 2 o'clock today, about the lifetime value of a customer and how to harness this. But what's really interesting about this is we all need to find a way to use technology to continually deliver value to our clients, okay? That's beyond the sale of the product that they purchased from us. So that when they're thinking about making decisions and they're contemplating the fact that this advisor or professional added value to my life despite actually having sold something, that's when you become meaningful. So the question and the, and the challenge I have to you is hopefully you've taken some of those ideas, you've written them down and you said, yeah, that is something that I can go and implement and make a difference for my community. The question, of course, for you is what can you do fast? If you're going to pretend to be a technology company, then you need to do sprints, as we've said, right? And that means we need to do those sprints that impact the customer experience. There's an interesting, and I drew this cartoon because that's my hobby, um, but I, I wrote it for you because uh, there's a, a sense of a parable uh, in the States that is often told. And it's a story of two, two people, two friends, that are actually in the forest and they're camping, and all of a sudden a bear shows up. Now the bear does not look happy, and the bear looks like he's hungry. And so one of the friends kneels down and he starts tying his shoe. And the other friend says, why are you tying your shoes? We can't outrun the bear. And his friend says, we don't need to outrun the bear. We need to outrun each other. We need to outrun each other. And so all of us are in this game, is that the technology is going to attempt to disrupt the margin, the hard behind margins business that we've enjoyed for a long time. Um, what we need to do is we need to be the people lacing our shoes and deciding to move quickly because this is going, we can't avoid this. Uh, and so the question is, are we going to be in the pack that's left behind, or are we going to be leading uh, by our example? I leave you with this. The reality is, is that we need to figure out a way to cultivate the human relationship. Can you relate to that? We have to do this uh, in, despite technology. This, and technology is intended to leverage our efforts, but hopefully it allows us to create more connections, more relationships, uh, and more meaningful experiences that are going to be sticky and stay with us for a long time. It will help retention, it will help long-term production, it will help the growth of our industry, and ultimately it will create lots of meaning in people's lives because we can support them. I invite you to join me at 2 o'clock today uh, to talk about one of the projects that I've been working on. I thank you for your time and I hope you have a fantastic journey.